guys, to um, Unorganized Plays Table Talk. Uh, once again, you're visited by um, Jared Reyes over here, Panda. Uh, this uh, way. We have, we have John Wojcik and a new cover, Mr. Wong. The other Wong. You might have met older Wong, this is younger Wong. Say hi. Hello, hello. So we have... Uh, Alright. What is well, the... Today's a... Go, Jerry. I'm sorry. Yes. <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm so you're sorry. Me already? Okay. <laughs> yeah, I can't see your face properly, so I don't know whether you're going to speak or not. All right. So uh, today we're talking about tournaments. Um, this weekend, all the members of Unorganized Play partook in a um, Ascension tournament hosted by Unrivaled. So if many of you do know or do not know, um, Unrivaled is a tournament series where people get to uh, play and depending on how far you get uh, from like small tournament to regional tournament you can possibly find yourself winning a trip to Las Vegas to pay to play for ten thousand dollars for a simple board game so yesterday the entire group went out in full force to play one game and uh, long story short I end up winning so I'm going to regionals yay me these guys lost Hey, but, uh, it, narrowly, narrowly. At ten points is, de is a decent enough in the lead for, in that game. Yeah, that's one Makana construct. I don't even want to hear it. Yeah, that was you taking the hard on cannon from me. Shut up, John. You lost twice. You you went to two tournaments that day and lost. I got second place in both tournaments. Well, second, second, and then second. <laughs> second in all tournaments. All right. Second so... in all rounds. That being said, I think today's discussion should be tournaments. Uh, all of us are seasoned gamers, uh, card gamers, board gamers, and the like, and what comes to the territory is uh, tournaments. Why do we go? Why? What's the appeal to them? Um, this one, the one we went to yesterday, the general appeal was there's a cash prize at the end of this series of tournaments and a potential trip to Vegas, so... What was the harm in going to a tournament like that? Not only uh, that, it's that? even big, it's even bigger than that. It's if you win your local satellite tournament, you get the invite to regionals. If you win regionals, well, you get a free you that, yeah, you get a free trip to Vegas. You get a free trip to Vegas. That's already a well enough prize. But then you get now in now you're in Vegas and you're placed and you win the nationals. Not only are you getting $10,000, the store that you won your satellite tournament in is getting $10,000. I think it's $1,000. And, <laughs> and you're getting a Geek Chic table. I did not actually hear about the Geek Chic table. Yes. According to, oh, according to somewhere on the internets, I'm not, ref I'm not recalling exactly where, being that Geek Chic is one of their sponsors... All the winners at Nationals are getting a custom Geek Chic table. Damn. That, like, Geek Chic is one, is like, is top choice for all gaming, like, apparel and, and furniture. That's, Apparently. Yeah, for those of you, like, huh? I've never been to a Geek Chic store, so, but I know they make good tables, I guess. They're, uh, they're Gen Con. They're at Gen Con every year. Oh, that's that like, those, Oh, yeah, tables are nice. Those, those expensive, fancy tables that none of us will, like, buy outright? Yeah, that, it's one of those, it's those guys. But yeah, those tables are expensive. Like a, just a general gaming table, ugh. That, like yeah, but those people. those tables are so so sexy. Like yes, we're playing we're playing tournaments for sexy tables. That's what we're doing. <laughs> they they really are like. <laughs> also, also they get. I, what, did they announce it? Uh, it's gonna be broadcast at some point. Uh, the it will it will be it will be broadcasted on the Umba website itself supposedly. And I thought someone said ESPN two. ESPN no... two, not the Ocho. <laughs> yeah, we're we got it's still uh, information still coming on that tournament, but nevertheless, I, it's definitely motivated us as well as other gamers to play it. And considering that they've now there's six different games you can play, some of them being quite randomized, like your chances of winning is are quite high, and it. 
And, uh, like, Ascension-wise, that takes more skill, but some of the games they've listed so far, it's like, uh, King of Tokyo is pretty much Yahtzee. If you can get the right dice rolls, you just win. Uh, how do you feel, like, currently, what, what's your opinion on, uh, the Unrivaled tournaments? Uh, True. John, you like to two. Well, John, you've been the two, so you had to have the most. Uh... John, you're in spot two, uh, so you have to answer. I, I, first. That's true. I, I have been. I have been to do. Um, luckily, our local gaming shop had a uh, a Munchkin unrivaled tournament. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, I said Munchkin. Oh, Larry! Larry despises that game, but yeah, continue. As as well as the Ascension tournament later that afternoon, and Munchkin apparently, if you search deep enough in the dark recesses of the internet, actually has quite a huge tournament and cult following. To the point where they have national tournaments for Munchkin and large tournaments at all of the conventions. Who did you lose to again? I lost to the um, husband <laughs> of the current PAX East Munchkin champion. Yes. Apparently, the PAX East Munchkin champion is a female, and her husband, nice, great guy, who's a teacher, decided to show up for the this Munchkin tournament, because his wife couldn't because she had a doctor's appointment. Otherwise, you just <laughs> would have been third otherwise, place. Otherwise, otherwise I totally would have been schooled. But um, I think it's more impressive. Yeah, it's like, yeah, it would be more impressive if you got your ass stomped by the current Pax East champion rather than the Pax East champion's husband. Yeah, yeah, no, completely understandable. But like Munchkin is one of the unrivaled games and. I ended up getting second place, having never ever played a game before, and you just played Munchkin? Re- never, never, never played a game of Munchkin in my life. Literally watched a five-minute YouTube episode titled "How to Play Munchkin," and was one turn away from winning the Munchkin tournament. <laughs> So we can definitely show how some of the games that Unrivaled chose for this tournament truly are completely random. All right, uh, let's list out the games that they're uh, having. It's, uh, you said Munchkin, that's one of them. We also, one, Munchkin also is have... one, Ascension uh, wait, is that's... two. Uh, they have Munchkin, Ascension, King of Tokyo, which is a dice game. Which, as I said, is pretty much like Yahtzee. You have to be able to roll the right, correct uh, dice to get points. So, that's one hell of a game. Um, Epic Spell Wars, Nevermore, and Villagers and Villains, which uh, we all mostly, most of us tried to learn yesterday. Um, so, uh, Munchkin, I, I truly say, is just completely random on your card draw and what monsters you pick up out of the deck. Um, Ascension really is truly skill-based because you need to know exactly what cards to buy and why and what your opponents are doing and so on and so forth. Um, Villagers and Villains is almost like Ascension Light where you're building a town, but the way that you get cards for your town is completely random based on a die roll. Let's also um, say that Ascension is a deck building game for those that haven't heard of Ascension. Um, And a deck building game revolves around uh, every player starting with the same basic, in Ascension's case, 10 basic cards. And every person's deck, they all have the same deck for each player, so it's 10 cards per player. Uh, and you use the cards give you either resources or uh, fighting ability. You use the combination of either or to either gain more assets and items into your deck or defeat a monster to gain some sort of prize. So as the rounds go through, you purchase up these items that become permanently part of your deck and you cycle through your deck as often as possible, defeating monsters and gaining victory points or um, I forget what they're actually honor. Honor in Ascension's, uh, honor points in Ascension's uh, case. 
And once the honor pool is run out, at, I believe it's about 25 per player. 30, uh, 30. 30 per player, sorry. Uh, the game is over, and then you start tallying up, you know, all of the honor points plus any card uh, that has an associated cost with it. And that's your total, and that's how you find out who the winner is. Um, so when we say games, like any deck builders kind of follow off the same concept. Uh, obviously, some changes in theme or minor rules changes. So in the case of villages and uh, villagers and villains, or villages and villagers and something or other. Uh, yeah, it's, villagers and villains. Is a deck builder, but with a sort of different take where you don't pick the card you want to purchase. You have to attempt to roll on its numbered spot, or you're forced to take... Uh, one of the lower end cards. Uh, so what's how would you describe Epic Spell War? Like, because we played it, and I'm like, how? Like, it's a really random occurrence of how to win that game. John, you want to take I, it? Or I, you wanna... I, I I remember playing it once, but it's way too long ago for me to really talk about it. All right, so, so uh, it's all up to you. All right, so Epic Spell Wars is a game where obviously you're a wizard. And you're trying to kill all the wizards, uh, which are the other players, and be the last wizard standing. If you're the last wizard standing, you gain a point. And I believe it's the first to three points uh, wins the game, quote-unquote. And uh, how you win and how you manage to kill your other fellow wizards is you get, I believe it's three cards in no, your hand. No, it's three cards. It's a beginning. Uh, what you're doing is you're assembling a magic spell. Each player is assembling a magic spell from... Uh using these random cards. And you basically have a beginning part of the spell, a mid part, and then and the explosive outcome of that spell. And based on what combination you put together, that's how effective or potent your spell is. And you use that to attack other players or defend yourself. And, but the thing was, that game is quite hard to like, you, it's really hard to aim damage at things. It's just like, you're just playing random spells and seeing where the dust settles from when i remember playing that game it's just like you can't really single out players in that game you're just like hoping to be alive by the end of it yeah i feel yeah. it depends how many players are per table but there's certain spells that cascade damage and obviously the more players there are at the table the more damage it will do uh, i think it was like rolling for a bit in a fireball or something something with cats i believe and there's like, no, it's like a, one creeping spell that did more damage the more players they were. Yeah, the so the first player to your left would take like, one, yeah. the player to his left would take two, and so on and so forth. And you were hoping okay. you weren't the last player. Yeah, now, now that I do remember this game, I remember it being truly, completely fucking random. Based on what cards you draw, and what spells you could actually play. And some spells are like unpredictable. They just like some spells just say trigger some other ability in the deck, and they're like, "All right, I wonder what the deck gives us." And it's like, "All right, trigger a new spell." It's like, it, it was like pan. It, it feels like pandemonium, which for a game like that, like it, it's it's a fun casual game, but for like competitive level, it's kind of interesting that they. Uh, well, I think a lot of these games. I don't know uh, what their process was besides picking them, but a lot of them are games that I wouldn't think immediately would be competitive. Um, I understand that they're trying to take the route where they're not just showing a card game. You know, like, they're not doing poker for money. Obviously, that's been done. They're not doing, um, like, Magic, you know, Magic the Gathering, the card game, or any of uh, Fancy Flight's offerings, LCG, stuff like that, because that is too formatted. It is too structured. And I feel maybe what they're aiming for is a very casual crowd that can essentially be an entry-level game and that's why it's so random because you could be skilled but up to a point it also requires luck and yeah, like, like uh for ascension like ascension is the game like most of us who went there knew how to play because like i'm a big ascension fan i played it since the beginning since that game came out and there's there's more competitive strategy and most of us were going to that tournament expecting expecting to be like a one-on-one -on -one type of event where it's like i um, wasn't well, I was I, I thought I was hoping it was going to be because no, it's too but, structured at that point. Ascension, you I might as well be just be playing a card game, not Ascension, on yeah, a heads I, up. Well, that's ironically, was, that's that's something that uh, Unrivaled has actually said to to multiple facets that they don't want any of their games 
to be played one-on-one -on -one in their tournaments because that completely devoids the point of the games they chose because all the games they chose were group-based games, a lot of them requiring at least three to four to five players to even be played. Yeah, like, I can't imagine Epic Spell Wars being played one-on-one. -on -one. Like, towards the end, but usually when it gets to that point, you are getting to a very, like, everyone's really low in life, so it becomes really tense. Whereas if you had full life and you just heads up on somebody, uh, it's a totally different game and feel. Like I said, you might as well just be playing a regular uh, constructed card game instead of a, um, lack of a better term, like a board or a pocket game. Yeah, true. Like, uh, Ascension, like, it is played, like, as I've played it in, like, the other, uh, the main tournaments that, uh, the actual company runs, it, it used to be f uh, four V, uh, uh, pods of four, or three or four, and then, uh, but uh, recently it was, it became a heads-up game. Uh, the fact that, uh, Unrivaled chose to keep it as, like, a pod game, it, there's still a competitiveness, a competitiveness, uh, competitiveness to it. It just English. changes everyone's. <laughs> Sorry, um, it's still a competitive game, but it does change uh, the way the game's played when there's three to four versus just one v one. In in that case, like Ascension, uh, with more than one, uh, with three or four people, it's very hard for some people who go behind to catch up. It now becomes a game of who can get ahead and who can stay ahead. And for people who somehow get locked out, like in a four, in a three, uh, three or four person game, it's hard for that one guy to to like somehow scoop the win uh, out of nowhere. Uh, from what I've seen, from my what I, what I experience in four and three uh, people gameplays. What do you guys think about that? Uh... It, it is true. As Ascension one on one in a two person pod basically is an entirely different game than a three or four person pod because on one-on-one -on -one, you are not only playing your game but you're playing your opponent's deck so you have to remember and 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 realize what your opponent is buying and what your opponent is leaning towards and try to adjust the board on your turn so that your opponent can't take advantage of that. Rather than in a three or four person pod, all you can do is try to adjust the board to stop the opponent to your left. And that becomes really, really difficult if the opponent to your left is not doing that to their opponent to the left. Yeah, you're basically, well, in still, in still same sense, like when you're starting out the a, uh, a game of Ascension, the more players you are, you have to figure out, all right, the person to my left is doing, is that's his strategy. The person to my right, is this strategy, the one across from me, he, he's, he's going this way. I have to decide what's the better strategy out of all three based on what the board's telling all of us. And I have to know three or four turns ahead what the board's going to look like. For example, if I know three guys are going to go economy heavy in this game, I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go military heavy because they're gonna suck up all the resources, but they're gonna leave me all the monsters to kill. That's pretty much how that game goes. Ends up coming in some cases. It's still competitive, but it's just that the mindsets get a bit different. Well, yeah, and that that was exactly the problem in in our in our four person pod is that Drew was to my right, so Drew was affecting my board. And Drew's brother was to his right. So in theory, Drew's brother, Older Wong, should have been paying attention to what his brother was buying and affecting the board to stop Drew from gaining resources, but instead was playing the board so that I couldn't buy things. Which yeah. at that point didn't matter anyway because the board had completely changed by the time it got to me. Well, to be fair, I was uh, I was doing the military uh, route, so I was trying to defeat monsters 
and uh, my brother was trying to buy things. So it was, became the thing where it's like, he would buy the things and then a monster would come up, where I would leave monsters on the board to soak up buying spots, knowing that you guys didn't pack enough military might to defeat the monsters on your own. Well, no, but not only that, like, your brother had a lot of things that would have void stayed at. And instead of monsters knowing you be killing them, he was banishing things that would be purchased. And it completely changed the game state at that point because he wasn't doing his job as the person to your right. I guess you're right. Which I guess... Yeah, which, which, yeah, which completely changes the game because I was paying attention to what the person to my left was doing and I was making sure that I changed my board state to affect the person to my left. Well, I mean, then that means where... I did my job to you. <laughs> yeah, which, it would, exactly. You did your job on your side because you would leave nothing but monsters that you knew I couldn't fight. And I had to fish for resources at that point. Right. Rather than your brother, who could have been banishing monsters and leaving you with a board of nothing but things to buy, wasn't doing that. Before we go, like, so, like, too far deep into Ascension uh, st uh, strategy and whatnot, I, I guess I guess maybe this is what they want, uh, the unrivaled people want to see, like, this type of fate is not completely in just your hands, it's in the fate of the people around you sort of gameplay. Exactly, I, yeah, I think, I think that's really why they blatantly said we want them to be larger games, because... Every other big tournament, CCG, every other big tournament, uh, miniature game or war game, is always one-on-one. -on -one. So you're playing just your opponent, rather than the ga all the games they picked are family-friendly games that are played in large groups. Some of them are sometimes random, but you are, but you do have to play not only Perfect. your opponents but the board. And, yeah, and that makes you have to play, like, a bit tighter, a bit per and you have to play as perfectly as you can without, and hoping everything else falls, uh, falls the way they should. Um, what about Nevermore? I, it's been a while since I played Nevermore, and that's the last game we haven't discussed yet. Um, from, from what I've heard of Nevermore, it's basically, like, um, almost like there. a... Con is dead. No, 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 I'm here. Oh, you just like cut out at almost like a uh, John is dead. Oh, sorry, sorry, no, no, because <laughs> because Jared asked if you were here. Never mind. Yeah, because you're, uh, you're the one who you're the one who hasn't who who's played more. Most oh, I games. played at least ten games of Nevermore, uh, yeah, maybe even more. Is, so what Nevermore is is, it, is a drafting yeah. card game, uh, and uh, I believe it's uh it, you draft cards and every card has a not a suit but. You, for lack of a better term, it has a suit. And those suits, in combination, uh, once you draft, finish drafting all five cards, uh, the order of which they are resolved is actually random, except for the first round. So the first round, you would have... Uh, it's a set order. You already know how it, it's face up, so you know uh, hearts. The person with the most heart cards gains that much life. And I believe it's if you have three or four of the same type, you also gain a victory point. Uh, and, and the is, goal is to get to five victory points in one or you, uh, or one you can also game fill turn. All your, uh, you can also, this is uh, Edgar Allan Poe. Well, the theme is Edgar Allan Poe type Raven. So you either get enough victory points or kill everyone on the table. Yeah. So with hearts, you essentially gain life. With daggers, you do damage. Uh, with uh, like I guess like a Holy Grail cup thing, a wine cup. Uh, you would get things called like um, like magic cards, and with you crows, and you essentially negate certain cards, or you must discard because having a crow is bad. It's kind of like an omen. Um, but if you have a lot of crows in your hand, you could also get dark, a different type of magic. So you kind of hedge your bets. Now, if like, you are if eliminated you from the game, crows. if you're eliminated from the game, uh, you're not dead you know, like if you die and you lose all of your life points you're not completely out you become a crow 
And then your job is essentially to harass people or kill them in order to get back into the game as a human. Uh, and obviously there's different combinations of cards that do certain things. Like, for example, uh, the crow player, uh, he cannot gain any of the benefits of the regular suits. But if he beats another person by having the most of said suit, he'll do damage to people or, you know, whatever negative effect he can inflict upon the other players. Um, so that it's, it's a game where you're never out. Even if you you're just barely hanging in there, you could still get back by being a crow, harassing people and plotting to kill them. And once you kill them, making yourself back to human and going back on track to win the game and or just killing everybody and then you win as a crow. Um, so yes. it's it's a, it, it is uh, there's a lot of strategy in it because you're bluffing you. You, since you're drafting, you get to see the cards that are going to the people to your left or right because uh, obviously it switches. Uh, the order of how certain cards are resolved actually matters. So after the first round that goes through and it, when it starts getting mixed up, you're not too sure if you should invest in certain suits if they'll, the payoff is not going to be there when it's it's turn to trigger. So it kind of adds a little bit of an strategy on that too. Um, and so, uh, you also have... Board games are pushing um, the need for, you need to have the right strategy as well as just the right timing or luck to be on your side when you win this, when you're playing these type of games. I think also I, with, well, see, as long as, uh, as far as I can see, uh, just using Ascension and Nevermore as the, the basis of it, since those are two games that we're most familiar with, it's also reading your opponent. Uh, if you start seeing, well, I guess maybe this is just an any draft card strategy game. If you start seeing, all right, well, I have, you know, my hand was, you know, X cards and I pass it and the person to my right passed me, you know, X cards. I can see within a round or two, like what their preference is or what they're trying to aim for. And I could either try to mess with that strategy by denying them cards and just hoping that, you know, through some way denying them is going to equal my victory or denying the person to my left getting the garbage cards because when you get those crows, they essentially discard a card out of your hand for every crow you get. So you can say, okay, my starting hand was two crows and three hearts. Well, obviously, I'm going to keep the hearts and toss the crows to the person to my left and see if they keep any to uh, further their strategy because maybe they want to go all crows and do something crazy or, you know, whatever, what have you. Or they're going to keep passing it down to somebody else down the line and see who's get stuck with it. And then they get a, they, if they don't have a strategy built around getting the crows and they start losing associated suits because of that, you know, it really messes with their whole thing. Um, so yeah, yeah, I think you're right. It's going to be a mix of strategy and kind of interaction uh, with people without getting too, you know, uh, no one V one mentality. Yeah. Well, it's kind of funny because now that we're having this conversation and I'm thinking about it, short of Kings of Tokyo, every single game that Unrivaled picked is basically a almost random factor game where you have to play your opponents over playing the board. Because, like, I it's... That. The, that that's that's the way it is in ascension you, the, whatever flips over is going to be completely random and whatever the other people buy is going to be completely random so you have to play a strategy based on what your opponents are doing rather than what the board state really looks like same with villagers and villains same with nevermore definitely and even munchkin to an extent is is that same way you're basically trying to figure out when your opponent's gonna make that big boost to hit level 10 and figure out what cards are in their hand that are gonna screw you over from getting level 10. Um, Kings of Tokyo, again, is basically just Yahtzee. I really can't see how that is really you playing your opponents. And there's a sixth game that we're forgetting somewhere. No, it's, it's villain. It's... Oh, Epic Spells War. Epic, Epic Spells War. Wars, oh, yeah. We're, we're just that. that thing is yeah. also like, and, and that's also quite random. Like, it's like, it's based off like whoever gets the weirdest spell off and just based off like who's left standing at the end of like everyone casting spells. Yeah, but no, no, no. I'm just, I'm just trying to say from a tournament standpoint, a lot of people are like, oh, these aren't really competitive games, or oh, these are all random luck factor games. And I'm like, now that I'm thinking about it and analyzing it, 
they are, but there is a really, really deep strategy that you're playing your opponents as you play the game. Rather like than, ra yeah, rather and than not just playing your opponents there, in traditional you, sense where they're across from you or something like that. You, you're yeah, playing more but, of but not only, the not mindset only that, of like if yeah, if I'm playing magic against somebody, like I'm playing the board, and then I'm playing my opponent. You know, when we play a war game, you're playing the models and the, the field, and then you're playing your opponent's strategy. Says so you. Of these yeah, games are yeah. Seems I, to be the opposite. I, I, you're I, playing I, your I, opponent I, first, I, and then you're playing the board. It's true. Like my first, the first round of that Ascension tournament where I was playing against this couple, like they haven't played that many rounds. Like it, to me, they uh, when I was playing them, it felt more like, oh, I'm gonna casually buy this. Well, while my mindset was like, I'm gonna buy this this turn. He didn't take this. I'm gonna take that on his turn. She killed this. That means that leaves me open. I was I was calculating way ahead before they realized what was happening and that's why I was scooping, scooping up a victory. So, yeah, there's, like, I would have said, like, out of Ascension, uh, I would have said Ascension was, like, the most competitive one, but, uh, seeing as we've been di dissecting these games, there is, these games do, uh, call upon correct plays and be able to read properly as the game develops. So, yeah, it's, I do think that they're, it will be fun to watch uh, how people play uh, these respective games, but there's also a draw to um, these games. Also, can draw like even random people, like experienced gamers, to random people. Like when they, when my family found out Kings of Tokyo was a turn was a game they can play for, I had like my entire family ask like, so can we join? Because I played King of Tokyo with my folks, and I've got I've gotten wrecked on that game. Everyone else is pretty good at that game, and I'm. I'm still losing to them because I can't roll threes at 17 po Like, I'm at 17 points. I need threes. The dice won't give me threes, and I lose because someone else gets to reform me. And I'm like... So anyway, yeah, it's kind, of, it's kind of funny. Like, all of the games that Unrivaled picked for this tournament were what I always traditionally referred to as, like, target games. They're literally games that you can go to a Target or a Walmart or a Toys R Us or a Kmart or any local big box store and pick it up off a shelf for like 10 20 bucks you don't need per se a local gaming store to find it yeah and it's all uh i think almost all of them without exception are less than 30 dollars a piece at least 30 at uh at retail they're less than 30 dollars a piece yeah i'm pretty yeah, sure kings of like, tokyo is less than 30 right or 30 bucks it's at least thirty. At least thirty. Yeah, yeah. Kings, of King, Kings of Tokyo, I think, is thirty or maybe thirty-five. But like, I literally walked into my local Target a week before any of these tournaments started, and I found four out of the six games on their shelf. So That's also the true. I think. Like the accessibility <laughs> for like anybody to like find out about this deal somehow on the internet and just go, hey. I picked up this game at Target the other day. I read the rules and I learned how to play it. I now have a chance to win ten thousand dollars. Okay, so this is a great time to change the subject. Like, while I'm sure, like uh, all of us, including you guys, will be wanting to play the other tournaments uh, besides Ascension. So I can agree. We can all agree. Like, as much as these games feel randomized, we'll we'll still be playing all these tournaments, right? Try oh, yeah. Definitely. Are you guys, guys going to say no? Yeah, yeah, yeah we're, we're gonna try, of course. Gonna yeah, you're gonna, we're going to try it, and play every tournament. To get... Yeah, at, at this point, because there's still satellite yeah, tournaments, you're literally just fishing for a way to get into regionals. And Wherever they may be. Games, there's, there's no excuse not to. So, Unrivaled yeah. is doing that. He's doing something right with, like, hey, anyone can play these games. Why not play for money? Or for a grand prize of some sort. And yeah, like any prize. Even if you're just like, I've never gone to Vegas, you know? Yeah. It, it, just a trip to Vegas would be worth picking up one of these games off a shelf in your in a store and going, okay, I'm going to learn Munchkin. Or, okay, I'm going to learn Villagers and Villains. Not, not only the and fact that they're great party games to play with your family or to play with your friends... 
Yeah, I and most of these games you can find how to play online. Like, uh, I know three of these games, like King of Tokyo Munchkin and uh, an Epic Spell Battle. They were already covered by uh, Geek and Sundry's Tabletop. Tabletop. So yeah. You can just watch that and learn how to play. Ascension has an app on iPad that's so um, informative. Just playing tutorial on on the Ascension app on the iPad, you know the game immediately. Not you know, only, guess really... what? <laughs> Ascension has the app on an iPad or an Android or any other local device. You can download it for free. You can get the base game oh. for free. Yeah. Guess what? On, free? On Vival... it... It's for free. Guess what Unrivaled is using really? for their tournaments? The first base set. Huh. I thought it was. I, I, it cost me four bucks when I got that. When I got this, the Ascension app. You have an Apple phone? No, no I have a. I had my. It's on my Apple. It's on my iPad. That's why it, you it said the be I Apple. before. <laughs> yeah, because oh, be. the yeah, uh, Apple, Apple, Apple store usually charges for things that are free. Yeah, I downloaded it on my Android literally for free and was you like, okay, I'm gonna have to buy. The, no, not the, the expansions. expansions. The you base have game. To pay for. Oh, the base okay, game's free on Android. But oh, the base game's all you need because that's what they're using for the Unrivaled tournament is the base game. Yeah, you can just learn there and that's it. So I so, guess... So yeah, so Unrivaled's definitely doing a good job trying to make this game accessible to not just uh, board gamers but to, to the casual, even maybe uh, just random people who just, want to, who just learned the game. So I guess we'll see how that uh, comes out. Um, so if you had a... For example, when I first heard about this, and I was like, these games don't seem competitive. Uh, and, you know, obviously subtracting the uh, not wanting a regular card game to be in the competitive scene for, like, even just, like, even if it was, like, 100 bucks or whatever. What games, in the, just off the top of your head, like, th three games that you think would have, maybe for next year, if, if uh, Unrivaled continues with it and doesn't use the same games, what games would you like to see as a competitive, but, like, still not super hardcore, not super competitive game in the Unrivaled series. Oh, what... Coup. Coup would be one game I'd love to see. Coup would be fun. That, that would be... That would be a fun... Uh... <laughs> like, talk about a game about backstabbing and, like, being able to read, read players. Like, a, like, and that game you definitely need at least more than... You yeah, need at least more would... people to play that game and that... And... Oh. Coup would definitely, Coup would definitely be up there. Like Love Letter, Love Letter would, would even be a good choice. I will not play Love Letter professionally. That I can't, I can't win. You game. always get out guessed. That's just you have bad tells, Jared. I don't know what to say. Just horrible bad <laughs> luck. You have really I bad luck. Bad tell on turn one, they call my card out. There's no information on that board. You emote too there, much, there, right? There, there isn't, but like it, that would still be, but like, it, it would definitely be a fun tournament environment because that's that's literally like 90% of poker is just trying to figure out what's going on in your opponent's head and what cards they have like I mean that's why I love playing Netrunner so much I love the bluffing aspect of it I love like everything about it you can do a blind run if you know about Netrunner Netrunner is a game of uh cyberpunk between corporations and hackers and you know, gaining information and whatnot but i love the really big thing is there's a lot of hidden information and sometimes you bluff and it works out for you and sometimes you bluff and you die because you know a seal team goes to your house and kills you you know like you don't know you take that chance and that's what i love about netrunner i mean obviously i wouldn't say netrunner being competitive because it would take too long all of these games would have to take at least under an hour for multiple rounds so things like love letter would be great because you play the first to five but rounds could be really, really quick, so it's not like something so then, you yeah, get bogged down on. Games like that would be great because they're also anyone can play them. Uh, it's kind of hard. Like, would, would I say Dixit? Because Dixit's way too. Oh, the interpret no, the interpretive Dixit dance. Dixit I love Dixit, but I don't think it could be. Uh... It'd be fun for anyone to play, but that's way yeah, that's way too much. Oh, yeah, I sure, think. I, I Okay, I'll see Sheriff. I'll see Sheriff, Sheriff as one. It's also a nice bluff game, but it, it, like you have to be able to um, negotiate and like somehow lie your way into um, exporting illicit goods from the Sheriff of Nottingham. Yeah, and the game plays really quickly, so I feel that that's also uh, a good thing in his favor if they ever try to record it, because it is 
uh, a bluffing game, a social game, and uh, well, there's not luck because you you know what cards you're gonna get and how you want to play them, but your ability to lie and or coax another player into not searching into your bag of uh, goods is uh, all of the game, which I think would make actually a great suggestion. Yeah. Uh, do you guys want to throw in any games that you think of? Like, I, but, uh, unfortunately, backstabbing games are the only card that only games I can think of right now, and there's a ton of them. Uh, I'm looking right now on my shelf, but a lot of them are backstabbing or long games. They're not like really short games. I, yeah, I, you, I love. You would, um, need, you would need a game that's you know an hour to like an hour and a half tops. Probably more like 45 minutes to an hour would be better if you're going to do it on a tournament level. That has and it to has to be... That a group of people yeah, that has a definite that base, a definite single winner. Yeah. yeah. That, that a group can play, because this, this is what the, I, I'm seeing their... Uh, their I mean, ML being. Yeah, like right now I would even say... I mean, I know it's relatively new and hasn't been super tested, uh, but I am looking at Overseers and Shinobi Clans. Uh, oh, Overseers definitely being a very uh, light, very, very quick game. You'd probably have to be able to play multiple rounds in an hour uh, to determine the winner. Uh, I, wrote since, a, I wrote a review on that. I love that game. Well, yeah, I, I, think it's a, I think it's a great little game. I don't know how it would hold up to a tournament scene as far as Unrivaled would go, but I feel it's got all of the, the guessing and the sort of almost like little mini deduction since it gives you, like Love Letter, it, it gives you Depending on how many players are in the game, it tells you how many cards of each are in comprised the deck. So you can start using some of that deduction skill that you would use in things like yeah, Love Letter was, uh, to figure out scores. With, uh, Larry, I basically understood like from the get-go, oh, this is, this is a reading game, so all I have to do is just read the table and read you guys. Read the table and read what your opponents are doing. Yeah, all yeah all and then try to call them on their BS if there is any, or try to play safe and try not to get picked on to get well, voted on. Was, none of you chose greed cards, so it's like, alright, I'm just gonna get greed cards and just get ahead of you every single round. Yeah, Let's I think that, that would actually make a really good choice. Shinobi Clams I just absolutely love. I love the artwork. Uh, I love the draft aspect of it, and you know, it's it's really cool, quick game. Overseers or Shinobi Clan, two different other dra like drafting games. Are also yeah, two drafting games. They're definitely well, both of them are drafting games. So I so, that and social deduction games. All right, so we'll see how uh, the Unrival Tournament series goes. We're we're going to be participating regardless. And if any viewers here want listening to us just talk shop about games, if you're in, if we've somehow intrigued you, you can look up look it up. Um, you have to have an Umba account, I believe. Yes. No, well, you, you can register. You, yes. You you need a Umber account to register, but if you just go to unrivaled.com, you can put in your zip code, and literally search for up to 200 miles away any gaming store that is part of the Unrivaled Association and thus would be in tournaments. Yeah, and the entrance fee was like 10 bucks to play a board game, and it's really and it's a really and these board games are. And these board games are actually fun. Like regardless of the competitive level, it's always these games are always fun to play. So if anyone's interested, like you can look up these games, or if you know these games, feel free. We'll be there to take you down, but feel free to play. <laughs> only if you're um, in the tri-state. Only if you're in the tri-state area. I'm not traveling like, Cali to. You had like ten people who's like gunning for spots. So, <laughs> well, I have my spot. You guys, you, you, you go find a spot. Uh, on that being said, uh, we we talked about a tournament, uh, entering tournaments for a grand prize, but uh, most of us, I think all of us here, we also play games where the uh, prizes aren't really the biggest, well, I don't know why, uh, we play a Game of Thrones, you guys play Netrunner, are the tournament, uh, are the prizes uh, that big in, in those type of games? That's more of like a prestige thing, almost. Like, so based on that, what what drives you to go to tournaments where the cash pri where the prizes might not be cash prizes, it might be something else or something smaller? What is it? The prize itself, or is it the prestige? Like, as you said, prestige, or is there something that you, that makes you want to play more tournaments? Um, with a game like that, at least me personally, it really more just comes down to like hey i play this game anyway let me see how good i am versus other people beyond 
my local crew or my group of friends. You know, the the prizes in, in games like those tend to be more of like the alternate art, cool so we, uh, print, you know, swag type deal. Just to give them a general knowledge, we're, we're talking about games like uh, Fantasy Flight Tournaments, uh, game, uh, like their games are like Game of Thrones, um, Netrunner, um, X-Wing. Prizes in that game aren't monetary. It's more or less, uh, from what I've gotten, alternate arts or different, uh, a different sort of prizes. Um, like acrylic tokens and reminders and stuff like that. Different types of swag versus what we what we were playing for yesterday. So, um, for some people, that's enough to play for. But uh, continue, continue from that. Well, what I also like about uh, Fantasy Flight is that most of the time, as long as the, it's not a really full tournament, and I'm looking at you, X-Wing, and I love you for it anyway, uh, most tournament kits have about 30 sec, uh, 32 or so copies of an alternate art card uh, pending. I think they switched it down to like 20-something now. but So for each kit that they store buys, you, they have an entrance prize for most Fantasy Flight games where just by entering, they give you an alternate art card. Uh, to everyone who participates, as long as you're within the X amount of whatever the kit carries, of course. And uh, the top tier players get a, in addition for winning, they get a different alternate art card of something completely different, and then acrylic tokens, bag, any sort of like random swag. Uh, I recall being in an X-Wing tournament where they only had 32 alternate art cards for participation, but there were 60 plus players. Uh, which was great because then it's like, oh man, I'm actually fighting for an alt art card, <laughs> uh, eh, you know, and uh, which was really cool. Uh, although uh, you know they they obviously had more uh, tournament kits because they do them in seasons, so people that wanted to, and this was like I said for X Wings, extremely popular. Uh, so that's probably the only tournament where I saw where they did not have everyone get a participation prize. I mean, they got other things, they just didn't get the one card that was advertised. You know, they obviously said we only have 32 copies. Only so, 32 we, copies would be given so away. So saying that just being able to play for the ultimate card, was that enough draw for you to play the tournament, or was there other factors that made you just want to play? Did you just... Oh, when it comes to uh, tournaments, I've never been an overly competitive guy. I mean, I talk a lot of trash just because I think it's fun, but uh, it's more that I like going out meeting people. When I used to play Warhammer, uh, I really didn't care how I placed, if I won or lost, as long as my opponent was having fun and I was having fun just playing around rolling dice and BSing. Uh, the social aspect for me is the, the the driving force to go to any tournament. Um, I like meeting new people. I like making connections. I like meeting, you know, like seeing familiar faces. If it's the same scene that, you know, if I, for example, I see Netrunner or X-Wing, I see a couple of the same old faces. And then when we started playing Star Wars Destiny, some of those same guys who played X-Wing or who still currently play X-Wing, I see them playing Star Wars Destiny, obviously for the Star Wars franchise that everyone knows and loves. And it's like seeing familiar friends again, and we just you know shoot you know, shoot the breeze and talk about random strategies in both games, and like how we like certain deck types, or we like certain heroes or villains, and that pretty much makes a choice of what we like to play. And I really like that. The community for Fancy Flight has been always awesome, so I've never had a terrible experience. I've seen one guy blow up in like one tournament, but then after that he cooled off. It wasn't at me; it was just in general. Uh, but for the most part, I've never had a negative experience when it comes to Fantasy Flight tournaments. And I, I, like, that's what I like about Fantasy Flight in particular. I know I've kind of run out. The like overall that. experience is what draws me in. And of course, I do love collecting alt art cards. It doesn't matter what. So it drives me both to just participate for the base one and then you know, not do crazy well. But like, it'd be great if I got one of the other alt art card tournaments too. Like the higher prices up. Just because... Sexy six, art is sexy art. Just... Yeah, I just, uh, I just love collecting. I got to get them all. Uh, John, any more to add to your uh, to yours? Um, no, not really. I I basically play in them because, not not to like. He just wants to say it out loud. To... He wants to get away from the house. That's his, no, no, <laughs> his no, wife no. may be listening, so <laughs> it's like he just wants to get out of the house. That's the thing. The like, I don't wanna, <laughs> it does not mean to come off as douchey, but <laughs> going to tournaments is something to do. It's not just, hey, we're all meeting at the local store or, hey, we're all meeting at someone's house and, you know, we'll just play each other randomly. Like, it's something to do that has structure and goes, okay, I'm competing for this. Even if it's a cookie, 
Oh, it's horrible. organized. Oh, we set up a tournament to play for a cookie. That's that's a great yeah. idea. <laughs> like it, it's organized and it's something that goes okay. I'm doing this for a purpose. Drew, will you play for a cookie? Uh, I would definitely play for a cookie, like a black and white cookie. Like a giant black and white cookie. Oh, that'd, that'd be great. Yeah, that'd All be right, great. Next, like... next Warlords tournament. We should... no, not Warlords. That's, a, that's Warlords. A yes, we're gonna play uh, a dead game. Piece. Next, next vampire. Next, next vampire, vampire game. game. We're gonna play yes. for a huge black and white cookie. Which, yeah. by the way, I love that we're bringing back. Like, I'm gonna call it retro gaming or necro gaming. I think it's fish called it, where we dig up old games, we buy them really cheap off eBay, and then we start playing them, especially CCGs that are no longer in production. This, 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 this could be this this entire, that could I know be it could be a whole different entire, shoot of yeah. yeah. We'll do that. Another yeah, day. That, that, that's that's a that's a whole that's a whole offshoot of videos and stuff that we can do because we can we we're already bringing back Warlord. We brought back uh, not Vampire the Masquerade. It's Vampire the Eternal, Eternal Struggle. Struggle. There we go. Yeah. Uh, so, well, it's still yeah. a vampire game, but this one's the the struggle that is eternal. Yeah, but yeah. No, I I keep calling it Vampire the Masquerade, and your brother's like, no, that's that that's game. the RPG, and I'm like, yeah. okay, it's what is it called? Yeah, it's I'm like, thing. I know it's called Vampire something. All right, all right. So next uh, Game of Thrones, or we're gonna do L five R eventually, but next uh, tournament, oh, we'll, we'll, I can't we'll play wait. for a cookie. Yes. I'm putting up a, a cookie as a prize. A black and white cookie. cookie. Those are the best. Black, a giant black and white cookie as a prize. I will wholeheartedly fight cookie. for that. Hey, Jujiki's right next is close by. We can get we can play for Jujiki's cookies. They have black and white cookies. They do have black and white cookies. Yes. Well, in my uh, my mindset, like as I come off as competitive, like when I'm playing with you guys, but yeah, um, playing tournaments. Um, I'm doing it for the experience, like, I, I am doing it for the experience, like, I'm not uh, super competitive, I'm not expecting to win the grand prizes or whatnot, um, like, this whole, um, the, this whole Unrivaled thing, I'm just doing it just because I know Ascension, and I, I, it'd be cool to see how far I can get, uh, when I'm doing the Game of Thrones, uh, tournaments, it's just like, alright, maybe I can, I just wanna, everyone's playing, I might as well, uh, see how far I can go, maybe I can outdo these guys. Which is always fun to do, knowing that you guys didn't. I placed higher than you guys. It's always fun bragging rights. Oh, that was that was great. That was last year's Gen Con for me in a nutshell. That was a uh, hey, here's Netrunner, a game you don't own a single card for, and you've never actually played a game. Here, join a join a national tournament and see how you do. Yeah, and that was like, great for me. Because I played because I played in like. Uh, I've tried out like mag competitive magic or um, even this just their sealed events because competitive magic is just way way out way up there in serious. Competitive magic is a job. You it's basically a job. Like, you need to take that as your job play. if you are gonna play prof professional magic. Okay, yeah, casuals can play this game. Pros are the ones who make the big bucks in magic. And I was in a sealed tournament where people you get all comers like casuals newcomers pros and the atmosphere for when i'm playing that game is so like heavy it's like i gotta play correctly there's so many judges who will like call me out on bad plays so and that's not and i didn't find that as fun it's like it's i it was i guess fun to play the game itself but having that in the back of your mind like the extra pressure, pressure of yeah the extra pressure of like you have to play play properly uh the stuff isn't going to slide if you make mistakes like that uh because they're because there's people all around you playing for, uh, for that for that prize, and you're like, dang, I just want I'm just here to play magic and enjoy the game. I'm just here for the magic. So just, what I, yeah, no. I think it's most ironic, and you guys can't see my shirt right now, but in post you'll see why that makes a lot of sense. Because <laughs> I'm wearing a shirt of the um, ugly Americans, and it's the wizard that keeps making himself drinks, and on my shirt it says magic. So. I so now, now that I think about it, maybe that, maybe that's what, maybe that's the appeal of the Unrivaled tournament. Like, now, in this case, it doesn't have to be as serious. Like, we're still playing. We'd probably be playing for something big, like a trip and money. But it's still like you're going to be forced off with a group of people playing a game where it's like it's not just about the strategy. It's just whatever falls into place. And I guess you can, you can uh, drive more enjoyment from that. Well, hey, I told you guys, I don't care if I make it in or not. I want to go to Vegas. I mean, I'll find any excuse to go. If one of you guys make it, I'll be like, I'm on that ship with you guys. Don't worry. 
I mean, I, I don't know how sober I'll be once we touch down, but that's up to you to clean me up. Yeah, it, it's, it really is an excuse just to go to Vegas, in all yeah. honesty. Like... Honestly, yeah, I don't, like, again, like, I don't see myself winning, like, Ch uh, Chubbs, who isn't unfortunately on this podcast, he was he is one of the best Ascension players, like hands down in the group. And he got in smashed. The world. And, and possibly the world, at least the United States. <laughs> like if you world played, champions, you know, like world champions like, dash US. Yeah, if, if there was a world, if there was a Hall of Fame, like anyone who's won a, a world championship would be there. And Chris, he hasn't won one, but he's enough prestige to be in that same group of people. They all know him. And then he didn't win that tournament. That, I find that I, I find that funny, but he's definitely gonna go gunning for one. I think. Maybe he just has tournament jitters. I think that's what it really is. I would have tournament. I would have more tournament jitters than he would. I don't. That's why I see every game as casual, even when it doesn't matter. I, I, there's no. I guess that's also why I don't take things seriously when I play. I just go for the most legit troll thing to do. And yeah. Just, and just go with it. <laughs> just let it roll. Yeah, I know. Which... I had to play in the finals. <laughs> yeah, I think I think this is actually a good uh, offshoot conversation about actual price support of tournaments because we're now getting into a point where, you know, you've got big money cash prize tournaments like Magic the Gathering or now this Unrivaled tournament. I mean, Spoils did you... it. You also, uh, if you remember, Ultimate uh, Upper Deck Entertainment did it for. Uh, versus Bursted, before it became an LCG, I guess. I, competitive oh, and stuff. I'm sorry, TM, not yeah, LCG. Back when it was a... <laughs> yeah, back CCG. Then it was a CCG. There's, been, there's been many attempts so... to make board games a thing, so uh, this is a. So I guess this is like the latest attempt. Because now we have esports, you know. but no real hardcore. No. Yeah, exactly. Except so because magic, magic is its own entity in 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 on itself. Yeah. So we've now we've now got a uh, a distinction almost that it's a three-way split between if you're running a tournament you're either a getting a cash prize b you're getting uh, uh, some sort of merchandise exclusive merchandise or thing. Exclusive. Exclu yeah, exclusive merchandise or exclusive prestige token or something and there's a third aspect to this that we really haven't talked about but affecting the game itself oh this is good right. i know where john's gonna stem with this one and i was about that's to say this too and i'm assuming it's of the asian variety that's where, you're, that's where you're going with this one right it is it is a huge huge deal when you can affect the game you're playing in or you can affect the game you're going to a tournament for, and there are not many companies that do this. Let's be real. You just want to play God. That's that that that's that, that's the main aspect. The, the ability. No, to... no, 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 no. It's it's not even the ability to play God, but it's the ability to uh, affect a story or to bring yourself into a game that you enjoy and love playing enough to go to a tournament for. Uh, let's and off the top of my head. I There's two games that did that. There's two games that three do that. Three games. Three games that okay, have done that. Sorry. I can only name two. But, uh, list them all for us. All right. So game number one that I can think of is Game of Thrones 1.0. And that's that's done though. Game of Thrones 1.0, which sadly has died and now become Game of Thrones 2.0. Which is still good. If you nope. want, yeah, which is still great. No, no, no. But if you won one of their big regional or national tournaments. You got to make a character into a card. Don't they still do that? Because we still have some cards that are. Netrunner Two does that, sort of, sort of. Uh, well, I think it's just FFG's kind of mode to do things now, in a sense. Uh, like, but you're right. There are there is a pure vanity thing in winning uh, certain tournaments or certain companies, where. They either write you in the story or you uh, affect the storyline. And I'm looking at O5 Bar, which we'll get to in a second. Or in the case of, you know, miniature war games with Dark Age, where you become immortal, which, of course, John is about to bring up, too. Uh, Warlords also. Warlords, uh, Saga of the Storm also did that. That was a great. That's what. I, that's actually one no, of the. No, 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 no. No, I will cut you off there. Warlords did not do that because AEG blatantly took the card that I, I wanted them to print 
and refused to print it and put my name on some other POS. They hmm. tried. I'm sorry, there's many issues, but the first the first instance of what you were talking about, I first experienced it unfortunately well, not unfortunately, I love still love that game. It was Warlord Saga of the Storm. So what the thing was uh, just for the general audience know, Warlords was a D and D campaign that was turned into a card game. So you're already in this world that the creators made up, and you got to play as different factions. And in some cases, uh, what you did in uh, based on a tournament or whatnot, uh, sometimes they gave you the right to, to change an aspect of a story or make a story decision. They also had different. Uh, Outside tournaments, they also had different challenges players can do, which is like slaying, um, uh, hunting big, down big name big, people, big name people, like an over, like you were controlling a warlord with an army. You can fight someone, uh, tier two character, which is an overlord. And if you defeated the overlord in his army, you got to fight dragon lords, which, as they said, own dragons. So they were throwing dragons at you. And if you somehow beat them, which you could do, like, with a good deck you could do on a regular basis, you got to fight a Medusan Lord, which was like the biggest, like, in that story, was a shape changer. They molded the world politically or physically. They were changing the aspect of that world, and if you defeated them with whatever deck you got lucky with... It not only affected the story, but you got to take the god card, basically. You basically said... The story had to be changed like, all right, the story team had to go, this character, this warlord, killed this Medusan lord in some sort of fashion in the story, because that's what you did. In and real life. Was, in real life, yeah. If you were an elf, and you took down an elf Medusan lord, they, they now have to scratch their heads and go, why did this elf kill this elf Medusan lord? But the thing was, you also got the Medusan lord, which was like a thousand dollar card with his items, and that was just... But having that story aspect was really cool. Um, and you guys are now seeing L5R. L5R was, was also an AEG game that had a bit more... Uh, was a game more tied to uh, affecting storylines. I didn't play L5R, but I believe you guys did, so... Uh, yeah, we played uh, briefly. Uh, not I have never played competitively. I'm not sure if my brother went to a tournament or not. But um, with L5R, which is Legend of the Five Rings, of course, uh, L5R for short was a game uh, sort of Asian-influenced, uh, Asian culture-influenced. You know, it had samurais, ninjas, uh, monks, magic, um, all of that. And uh, the, it was separated into seven great clans. Of course, there were more and minor clans, but they were essentially, for, um, for lack of better terms, there were seven great clans, and each one had its own archetype. And uh, what was great about L5R, uh, just in general, even now the community, is most people uh, stuck to one clan. Uh, for example, uh, if you want to be really political or honorable or, you know, be the greatest duelist, the Crane clan was kind of seen as this, the, every embodiment of that. Uh, you know, if you want to be, example, the Lion clan had, uh, they were protectors of uh, the emperor. They had a large standing army. They were really aggressive. And, you know, you know for every clan had its own archetype, but... I guess the point of it is that a lot of people associated either characteristics or traits with that clan and they followed that clan fiercely. They went to tournaments, they played this one clan over and over, hoping that they could change the outcome of the storyline since that was the prize for their bigger tournaments. Uh, and if uh, that clan won, they would change the storyline fundamentally. Sometimes even cards were killed off or, you know, turned away or like it just the whole history changed on based on which clan would win and that was really cool um thing to affect because you can see you know like everyone's fighting for the pride of their clan the pride of their faction and stuff so that really a lot of people became really invested in this game and it, it ran for 20 years i believe before the aeg decided to sell the rights to fantasy flight which right now fantasy flight's getting ready to release in august at gen con which is awesome we're all gonna play. We're, you know, we're all. Everyone in the group's already foaming at the mouth about like, oh, it's gonna be so cool. The previews they've given and stuff. But so far, like, so, uh, like I'm I said, because you guys are playing. Yeah, it's it's really cool. And I was gonna say this is the X tournament prize where 
uh, it's either vanity or you're just pride in a faction or pride in art to shape the world uh, is uh, the ultimate prize you're chasing, which in my sense, I feel, you know, I'm, I don't think I can ever win, you know, tens of thousands of dollars. And I honestly, I don't know uh, what kind of people that would attract to certain tournaments because, you know, when you play for money, it's a little bit different, but I would still would rather play in a tournament where I could be essentially immortal, you know, like, and not just immortal as, you know, whatever, but affecting the storyline where people know, like, oh, that's this player. He affected the storyline like this, and it was so great because, you know, he thought of X thing to happen. Or uh, for me, that is the greatest thing that uh, I will be playing for uh, once I start playing. Or, or you become the greatest enemy because you decided X <laughs> character needed to die. Oh, yeah, someone's like, definitely like, died. Which clan disappeared? Like, the, the Nagas died, right? There was a Naga clan, and then some... Uh, yeah, in, in, in the new iteration of the uh, LCG, now under FFG, right, so it is set in a time before uh, certain clans came to existence or certain factions, and some people are a little bit sour that their clans were, uh, I wouldn't say erased, but retconned where they may not be discovered, and pending if the storyline doesn't go their way, their clans may never be discovered. <laughs> yeah, like... Yeah, so there were like a couple of factions that essentially got like up oh, erased because we started we reset the timeline to you, you, a certain you, point, which you, is actually really interesting. We pushed the clock back to a very interesting time since I believe the original story kind of was more or less the same time, but they there are some key moments that didn't play out in the original of where they're starting. So, much, so yeah, based on this, like how much lore was there before this time reset? In that oh game. boy! Uh, oh, like books and books and books I'm twenty and years of thing, but I don't know how. Uh, see, I'm not an expert, so I'm gonna go. Um, correct me if I'm wrong. I'm sure I'm gonna like edit and put like things everywhere. Like I am completely stupid and wrong, but oh, I think it was a two hundred year span. No, so less than two hundred like, years. It had to be at least a, a lifetime of a character, maybe sixty years or so of a character's lifetime, maybe more, we, we like in story. We can easily say like a hundred years of, of okay, story. So so we can took easily place. say it's like it's like when Disney took over the Star Wars franchise and just said all these books are no longer canon. Yeah, all of this is not canon. Only the movies are canon and the books that we print. So with that That's said, uh, the, some factions got uh, and I don't know if they're erased permanently or they I mean they mention them in passing, but they're not a playable faction right now as of when the game launches in August slash September. So some people um, are a little bit myth by that. They could be removed from the world completely. Or they may not exist because you have to win and shape the story for them to come back to so life. There, there are a lot of, there'll be a lot of clanless identity, identity crisis people like happening right now. You know, there's definitely oh, yes. people that are saying like, well, my clan's not here yet. Or maybe it may never come at all. So time to pick a big clan to rally behind. Yeah. Back to square one. Yeah, it is back to square one, which I feel bad for those players. Yeah. Uh, but, I mean, their clan's not completely erased. Uh, some characters kind of got back on, but it might be. I, mean, you know, I guess maybe it's a rough spot, because like I said, uh, a lot of the L5R players uh, dedicated their time, dedicated everything for their clan, and now that their clan's no longer there, they're like, well, I hope my clan gets made, because I spent so much time invested in the storyline, the characters, the histories, you know, and like if you ever meet an L5R player, most of them are very, really into their game, really hardcore, at least the old school guy. Obviously, there's new players not, not that... Even, no, but they're not even into their game. They are into their clan. Yeah. They represent that clan in their real life. That yeah. is who they, quote-unquote, almost worship as yeah. a collective. Yeah. Yes, and they're like weird clans like... Well, no, we, 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 we ostracize one guy because he's Unicorn Clan. Yeah, it's not that he's weird, we just... Is we Unicorn just... Clan still there? No, Unicorn is still there. It's one of the seven great clans. Yeah, so if you're a Unicorn, you're Unicorn for life. That's pretty much what... <laughs> yeah, like, these are these are guys who have, like, tattoos of their clan. Yeah, they're, because they're really they in the embodiment of... Well, and it's, it's funny, in the game, there's no real Unicorns. They just say Unicorn, like... Yeah, we just we just make the running joke that they're riding on unicorns with the horns on their head and everything. There is no ice. I don't think so. I don't think there's any real unicorns in the game, but they're just, the clan is called the Unicorn Clan, and our friend say, plays it. Like the, so it is a bunch of guys who like the idea of horses with horns on their head. No, no, I don't think they're like bronies or anything. I just think <laughs> just they they you know they're really into um, 
they, for example, they, the they, unicorn they, in story are kind of like Mongol, not Mongol raiders, they're like Mongols, they're horseback riders. A lot of their tactics revolve around that mobility, uh, skirmishing, and, you know, uh, fluid movement and combat. Um, so, but I mean, of course, they have their own beliefs in the story. And like, like I said, a lot of people associate themselves not with, uh, with clan beliefs or clan ideologies, and they kind of stick to that, which is really cool because some stuff is really like noble and obviously very mystic and stuff like that. Um, so it's got a huge following and I'm sure once we get the reset, because for example, uh, anytime a game gets remade, reset or whatever, uh, a lot of new players come around cause they no longer have to collect, uh, well in the old CCG model, thousands and thousands of dollars, or they don't have to chase thousands, and thousands of cards. It's getting in at the ground floor uh, is, the reset is a perfect, big deal. great thing. Cause now it's like, all right, I maybe invest $120 retail. You know, obviously, uh, if you get a discount, it's a lot cheaper. I now have a full playset of everything. And all right, next month or in a month or two, you're going to release a pack that's $15 retail, you know, $10 maybe at discount. All right, so every, you know, every other month or once a month, I spend $10 to upkeep with the game after the initial buy-in. That is a lot easier pill to swallow than, all right, let me try to get into this game. Uh, how many cards do I need? All right. Uh, and is this random? All right. So I'm going to need a couple of hundred or I'm going to have to get hand, uh, handed down cards from other people. Uh, that is quite the investment, both in either time or money. And when you reset the game and now it's starting off the ground floor, like I said, minimal investment to really get in and dig in. And I see a lot of players getting excited for that. So I'm really excited to play that. All I know is if I win a tournament, I want to make a bit, I want to make either some sort of Panda or Bear Clan who joined me. <laughs> A panda or bear? Oh, is there a bear clan? I gotta no, think on that. Clan. There's, there's, there's I'm trying to think of the minor clans. A group of like monks if, that would follow like the pandas. If if there if if I somehow won a tournament that made up a clan, I'm so making my own clan. A a, 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 a clan of bears. A panda clan. Like uh, a, a calm well, no, again. type race, uh, like clan that's like all focused on like. Strength and okay. bigness. Okay. Strength. Well, yeah, that's just, that's the thing. L five R is mainly all human based, so it's not that you're making like uh, humanoid panda creatures as you know a clan. Well, you're we don't know, John. We just don't know. A, <laughs> you're just making a human oriental based clan that will follow the ways of the panda. There are Probably snake people, monk. John. Okay, besides for the Naga and, you know... Shadowlands and stuff. Shadowlands, they're mainly all human-based. Yeah, they're yeah, they, they are. The they're just... Yeah, okay, you're right. I think that's like both their clan animals. animals. Just, just to make Panda Clan. The seven great clans at their base are all human. They just, you know, they take different politics, different ideologies, and that's what really separates them. Yeah. But they're all human. But they you know, all just, it's like the kind of... Of like, of, like, the Kung Fu movies, like, I do eagle claw or something like that it's that's pretty much the idea yes we're yeah. making the nobility of an animal to represent our clan sort of yeah you can say that all right um so uh backtracking back to tournaments since that's our our, our main topic yeah we kind of like top. we keep like, veering we're, it's really hard, hard to keep like, us too. on track sometimes it's like herding kittens i'm, I'm like god damn it let me, let me let me get back in there um well, we, we, we've been, like, dancing around the subject. Like, good experiences and bad experiences at tournaments. Like, so the general idea of, was, of going to tournaments is the experience in itself for some of us. Uh, what? So you've already kind of went around uh, what's, what was your best experience was at, at these type of uh, tournaments. What's the appeal for people who are like, I want to get... I, we've been talking about it, but how, why, do, why should I join tournaments? Like, I just play this game for myself. Why? Should I play with other people? The drive. Uh, well, for me, uh, like I said, it is the social aspect that I enjoy the most. I love meeting new people. I love uh, when I used to, well, we played, uh, for example, Warhammer. I was going to say when I used to play miniature war games, but I still play miniature war games. When I go to a tournament, I look for, you know, networking, um, social, you know, whatever. Social, just having that social interaction with the player. You can't get that in a video game. I mean, you could talk to somebody on a mic, on a, you know, computer or a, xbox controller through a headset unless you really know the person like if i if i'm playing with one of you guys i know you guys enough you know where it's 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 well and fine but just talking to a random person feels kind of odd communicating like over a computer over net feels odd to me i would rather meet a person say hey how are you doing and 
get to know them and just have a fun times of blowing off steam because this is you know for for the most part at least for me playing games i'm not getting paid to play games it takes up time but and you could say that time is an investment uh i am burning time where i could be making money but instead i'm using it for leisure and i want to have that as leisure time um so but when i go i'm not looking to like minimize every centimeter of an inch if it's a war game or minimize my deck to be every card has to be you know like 99 percent efficient i'm going there to just blow off steam have a talk with somebody and if they serve beer there at the same time then i'm in heaven even better <laughs> even better if i could just drink without getting you know escorted out of a dealer's hall or something then that's even better for me hey we still gotta make those talks about uh hosting a tournament at uh beer garden that's yeah still, like, to do. uh john what's your what, what experiences do you want like people to enjoy while going to tournaments or why you go in particular as you said well you have to realize the tournament you're going to is really going to affect the experience that you have there if you go to a tournament like a magic tournament you are going to have a completely completely different experience than if you were to go to a netrunner tournament or a Game of Thrones tournament, or even an L5R tournament, or a miniature tournament, because you have to realize that people are there, most people, I'd say 90% of the people, are there for the prize. And that's what they have on their mind. And the bigger the prize, the bigger the attitude of the people that are going to be there to play it. Or the, I'm sorry, but, but the mechanical nature. I remember going for, and you were part of this too, John, when we played Versus and we saw the million dollar payout and we all went into play and Hodge quit after round two or something. <laughs> I think it was like six rounds. Hodge was like, yep, I'm done. Second round, went to the bar. It just ended the day there. Uh, Why? And you noticed, no, because uh, a lot, there were so many mirror matches, so many of the same deck, because that was the winning deck type. It was purely mechanical play until you got to like the fifth or sixth round, and then you're kind of just like, you. I remember uh, facing off a guy. He's like, "Oh my god, thank God you're not playing X deck. You're actually playing like a deck that's you know that seems like it's a lot of fun." And he actually wrote about. Uh, you know, I can't find the article, but I remember. I think it was on. It wasn't Card DB. It was one of like one of those um, uh, where they buy card sites or whatever. Uh, and he wrote an article and he mentioned me. He's like, "Oh, the only highlight of my day was playing against this person because." He seemed really relaxed. He was mechanic. He wasn't a mechanical guy, just running through his cards, going through the processes. He actually wanted to talk about the game in X and Y. And and I, he I was, was not playing X deck because everybody else at that tournament was. Yeah, playing everyone was playing uh, one of two decks that were, you know, not guaranteed wins, but obviously had a really high chance of the, winning. The percentage numbers just stacked in. Favor. Yeah, it was just stacked in their favor, and you know, so I I found that the greatest form of compliment when I got you know the guys like, oh, I really enjoyed playing this opponent really relaxed he just made a lot of jokes and we had we had a great great time and the guy even said i was having a really crappy time just seeing the same deck until he came across you know myself so i thought that was really cool I, I, yeah, think, that... I think we bring that i think that is just us as a group just brings that out like we just play whatever we want to play and just go uh, whatever some of us some of us some of us <laughs> some of us but majority... i'll put that somewhere here uh a good yeah. majority of us just bring the decks we just want to play and just go we're playing it if we do well congratulations we're we're making the meta yeah i um, love i love playing uh oddball decks like i know obviously there's uh there's no you're going to include some cards that people see as staples because for example like if you're playing a game that needs economy you want to include economy cards maybe there's only x amount of economy cards you're going to pick a card that obviously go into most people's decks because it just makes sense but at the same time, a lot of our group tries to homebrew, and that's why we play and test a lot, no matter what games we play, to try to see, like, hmm, can we make this use this card okay? And some of us will go of a higher extent <laughs> of trying to make a really bad card good, and some of us will be like, oh, I don't think we can make it good. We're just going to pass on it, and we'll go for a medium card to make good. I'm, uh, trying, I'm currently trying to make Voltron John deck. Mm -hmm. oh, just arm him with everything. Voltron John. Like, level 7, Jon Snow from Game of Thrones. Give him, like... You know, you can crown him with the with the Wildling crown. 
put the cloak on him and play that ranger that makes rangers um gives them uh power. Gain an icon. Yeah, so you can make him a a, a trike uh tri tricon king. John. A tricon king. Nice. A, a tricon Builder king Stewart. who is also a builder steward ranger. Yes. Nice. The Voltron John. That, that, that's that's my deck idea. I'm trying to make that work, but it's just like, I have no idea where to start. Yeah, sometimes yeah, no, you start they're... stumbling on <laughs> Yeah, which which goes back to my original point. You have to realize the tournament you're going to and what the prize is going to be. Because it will really affect and change the experience you have going there. If there's a cash prize, all people are, are going to be... You're... Yeah, all bets are off. People are going to be playing for blood. You know, like rather that. than... You're going to have to play precise because someone's going to call you out on it and you're going to have arguments all day. Exactly. Rather yeah. than somebody who's only playing for an alt art card or somebody who's really playing for, you know, tokens, it's going to be a lot more relaxed, enjoyable environment. I, no, you know, those... Also, uh, don't get me wrong, I like playing against competitive people. I just... Because uh, I don't mind playing against someone who's competitive and someone who's maximizing that. I just don't want them to be a dick. I don't care if, like, yeah, you brought you you. Everyone has their own reasons to go to tournament, and for some competitive people, that is relaxing for them to have that sense of control to play a game and win, and that's fine. I don't mind getting stopped, but if the guy's not even trying to make an attempt to like laugh here and there, just like make a joke, like then I'm just like, oh great, I might as well be just be playing computer or something. You know what I mean? Like I don't mind playing against competitive decks. I actually like playing against competitive decks because. Part of the Jag decks is kind of creating silver bullets to certain decks, and I feel like that's kind of like the art form that I like going after when I make certain decks. Uh, I like to see what's in the meta and then kind of counterbuild it with something that nobody sees, and that surprise is usually what gets me wins, which I like, because then people are like, oh man, I never thought of using X card with Y, and then, you know, they I've seen people take certain ideas and make it their own and build upon it and make it better. So like they, they see combinations they wouldn't normally try because they're too scared to try it, or maybe they just didn't think of it that way. And no, then it they're, evolves they're into something better. Uh, yeah, they're too, they don't realize that certain interactions with cards because they never thought, like, you know, they never thought of putting two and two together because it doesn't seem too obvious. But, uh, yeah, uh, if you're a competitive player, I'll, go for it. I don't mind the challenge. I like facing competitive players. Uh, our group is full of a, a couple of competitive players, so I, I just grew up uh, naturally doing that. So sometimes when I face people and they see how I react to certain situations, and they're like, oh, are you a competitive guy? I was like, no, no, but like, since I play with so many competitive people, my mindset is to have fun, but like, some things I see purely because I play with, with our group, if that makes sense. Like, there's certain patterns that I see that I automatically know where certain things are going to go, and I kind of, like, shift against it, not to, you know. So, that, so this is the flip side. Have you ever had, have you ever had bad experiences at t these tournaments? Like, like so, what's, what's the worst experience you've had, like, playing against the, uh, those type of uh, players or whatnot? Like, is that, is that the worst type you've ever met, or... Have you ever have to experience worse or seen worse at tournaments? When Versus was competitive, I could say that was possibly the worst group of human beings I've ever played a card game against. I've ever played any game against. Wow. Even Yu-Gi-Oh? Even Yu-Gi-Oh. Wow. I don't remember crazy. John saying a lot of bad things about Yu-Gi-Oh. I just remember him playing at Dexcon like once or twice and beating little kids for their lunch money. <laughs> no, look, the, the, when, when Versus was competitive and fucking Upper Deck was giving out cash prizes, it literally was the worst group of human beings I had ever experienced in gaming. And that's including Magic, because John used to play a lot of Magic, too. And that, include, that includes Magic players. Like, Magic players, uh, even at the higher and lower ends, have almost like a camaraderie to them and when you rolled into versus it was like who the f are you what the f are you doing here get the f out of my house i mean this is this is uh more than five years back this is almost eight years back so I, obviously if they have something running now we're not trying to bash them for what they're doing now no, you know no, i don't no, know i haven't been in that no 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 competitive pure upper deck 
versus when they were giving out million dollar cash prizes. Yeah, yeah. like because I mean, obviously, maybe they uh, with the LCG ish format they're running or what eternal format or whatever they want to call it, it's uh, completely different than when it was a CCG with a cash prize on the line. Yeah. So, so I mean, because I think someone said they bought the versus now and it's actually a really good game because they changed the to all mechanics around it. Uh, which I'm kind of interested in just peeking into I, it, but not necessarily one playing has, it. Well, one, uh, he doesn't play with us, but one has that game. He, he buys another uh, versus. And Fish has a whole bunch of them, I think too. Fish has some, he, too. He got, he got, one got uh, a Fish into playing that game. Gotcha. Um, I have, I have, yeah, so I have both stories on both ends of uh, good experience and bad experience at tournaments. Like, after playing a while, a lot of them, you get these. Um, so at Gen Con, I was playing these, oh, when, I forgot what set. I think it was um, Magic origins or 2014 so that was a while ago i was in the tournament uh draft tournament uh or was it sealed it, anyway it's that type of tournament where you're playing for packs so based off your record you get packs so i get sit I, I was sitting against this like family of uh this family of magic players so you had the mother father uh first kid and then their second oldest kid who was like eight and I get paired off against the... I was losing that tournament, and I was paired off against a little kid. Oh, no. And I needed one more win to... Uh, I needed one more win to get a prize. And then he stomps the floor with me, because he just played a combination. He's like, I got nothing. Well, there goes my chances. He's like, nah, take the win. And I'm like... I, he's wow. like, I don't, have, I don't have enough wins to get a prize. You, you can just take it. And I'm like... Wow, you just got it. You're like, God damn! I got it. stoned by like. He's kid. like, I kicked your ass, and I'm gonna make you take a prize. So it, he's so, like, that's how you know he felt really bad for you. He's like, I'm sorry, dear large man. Here you go, take a pack. Maybe it'll brighten your day. So I got two packs. When I got my prizes, I walked over to him and his family. It's like, pick one. You deserve this. You deserve both. But I'm, I'm, I'm still keeping one pack. Because that was the only thing you could do. It's like, yeah, he gave me, this man gave me two packs. I had to give him one back. Oh, that's nice of you. Uh, unfortunately, the negative story would be actually I am the perpetrator in this in this scenario. Unfortunately. Tisk tisk. <laughs> yeah, I was. Uh, so when it gets really competitive, I get really nervous and really stiff, and really serious. Like, just because I'm intimidated by like the whole pressure of, of it all. So we were playing Ascension, the Heads Up Ascension tournament, uh, the World Championships, uh, at Gen Con again. And, like, I was just really focused on trying to win, like, trying to not make the same mis trying to not make mistakes. And unfortunately, I'm paired against this, like, middle-aged lady who just apparently learned the game recently. And I'm just doing, I'm just doing, I'm just doing me. I'm just playing my cards really fast. You've seen me play, me and Chris play cards, right? Yeah, you just, I mean, you, you don't even put them in the center. You don't count it out. You just make a pile. Well, no, I, well, in, in tournament settings, I make sure they see everything. But you know how a machine I am. I, I, me and Chris can be. We can just play cards and just go, I'm picking this and this and this. Yeah. Without, without hesitation. And it really, and then I, I didn't, it didn't dawn on me how intimidating I was being. So I won that match. But then I heard um, her talking to like a tournament organizer before, and I felt really horrible. She's so like, "Yeah, I don't think tournaments are for me." And in the back of my head, it's like, "That's so my fault." <laughs> Sad. Shame. Shame. Dude, Get the I shame gift like, going. Yeah, like I felt so ashamed of that. It's like, oh my god, I, like, I just, I dissuaded someone from playing Ascension. I, I, Not only I, did I beat an old lady. Oh, no, you always exaggerate when it's a story ladies. like for comedic effect i just now i just imagine a lady on a stroller or some sort but and jared just like pushing so her badly. over yeah i and i knew the guy or i knew the uh, the guy she was talking to i knew him too because we met when we played uh before i had to walk out to like dude i'm so sorry i did that the guy just looked at you like oh you disgust me <laughs> Like, I heard what happens. Like, oh, I'm so sorry I just did that to someone. And then I lost the tournament. That's what you get. Serves you right. Serves you right. <laughs> so, so, yeah. I can't, so, even I can be intimidating when, like, the stakes are up. It's just... It's not who I am. It's just that it, 
when the stakes are so high, just my mind just like, I just don't want to mess up or do something wrong. In that case, it kind of gets a bit um, intimidating. I, I felt that way yesterday too with that couple. It's like, am I being a bit too harsh or just too cold when I'm playing? They seemed fine, so I, I don't think I intimidated them too badly. It's different when I'm playing with you guys too. It's just like, eh, whatever, it's just you guys. Yeah, because I'm just like, actively, you know, talking yeah, shit the whole time. <laughs> you're, you're actively trolling me anyway, so it's like, yeah, it's whatever just, I do is not going to affect you. I just keep going, are you sure that's what you want to do? Is that really what you want to do? I mean, it has nothing to do, because I don't have a set strategy when I go into anything. I guess that's just like a common blanket that covers me. I just, you know, I roll with the punches no matter what goes on, and I don't plan that far ahead. Um, and uh, so, I, let's see, do I have a really bad experience? Now that I'm thinking about it, I don't, I don't think I've ever had one directly. Well, have you uh, seen, like, someone go off on someone in the middle of well, a tournament, and you're like, this is horrible, what the hell? I just like remember in a tournament, I think we were at Adepticon, and we were in a team tournament, and there was, like, a couple of tables away. I guess some guys were saying that they were, some people were fast rolling or picking up the dice too fast. Before, uh, and then it was, like, a pretty big thing where a bunch of judges had to go over. John, you remember that, right? It was... Yeah. It was, like, eight years ago, I guess? Wow. We really get a team tournament. I just remember, like, everyone's playing, everyone's having a good time. And even, like, that was a really cool tournament because it was a team tournament, and... I never felt like at least my opponents. I know I don't know. If, I think John had an issue in one of his things. One of one of the matches was like iffy, but not like bad. Um, all of my opponents were like really laid back, so it was like I had a lot of fun. Even though it was like an eighteen hour plus day for me in particular. It was rough. Oh yeah, it was rough. you forget tournaments are grinds. Yeah. yeah, that's when you have to play. You know, four rounds at two and change hours apiece with the break in between. You're essentially on your feet the whole time. It, it really grinds you down, especially when I didn't sleep the night before, really. Except like an hour the night before. Um, that's, not, that's not anyone's fault but you. Oh, well, it's everyone's fault. <laughs> um, but like I said, it, I didn't have it directly, but I could see these people, like, you're right, some people do get in that, I'm in the tournament, I have to play super serious, I have to do this and that, and then they forget that, like, uh... Especially in the first rounds, it's like it's not like the tournament defines you. It's just something else. I, I guess for so, like I said, some people I understand why they want to be competitive and they want to win and they want to do well. Uh, but I guess for me, like I never saw the appeal in it, so I never understood why people would get angry about it or why people would either cheat or uh, get into the, like I never panicked in a tournament. I know John used to throw up before tournaments uh, to really? flush his system of jitters. Yeah. yeah. He's throw up before every tournament. I know, I can understand that. I can understand that being... Tournament jitters. I never had tournament jitters. I uh, I don't even have fear of public speaking. Maybe that's why. I don't have a fear of public speaking. I don't know if that goes hand in hand or if that's a sort of psychology thing. Where, no, uh, I have no fear of public <clears throat> speaking, and I would still get jitters before tournaments. Yeah, I don't... I don't know why. Just, like, I love the spotlight, so... Um, uh, that never occurred to me. It never occurred to me to be competitive where... Uh, you know, even if I was handily winning over somebody, I would actually slow down and not try to crush them by a lot. And I wasn't trying to be, uh, what's that word I'm looking for? Well, I wasn't trying to just, I, cause I'm not trying to showboat. I'm just trying to get the win while not making a, somebody's day miserable or bad. Uh, even if I knew that like getting a higher score would mean I would be placed better. I would just be like, all right, I'm just going to play the game. And even if I lose a bit, I'll let them catch up a bit and not just throw the game, but just not be uh, super calculating at a point where they don't have a chance to at least get some interaction back uh, in the game. Because like I said, some people play just to get out of... John gets now, especially now, John gets plays to get out of the house. And that's... Uh, Hodge does that. He goes to events purely just to get out of the house sometimes. And, you know, for them, it's Let's like... Hope wife never hear this. Oh, no, yeah, it's hope they never hear this. Because I mean, everyone with the wife, even, like, uh, Gabs and Chubbs, I bet... Uh, you know, and no one wants to hear like, "Oh, I just want to leave my spouse at home and just, I don't, I'll take up, you know, like sleeping in an opium den and just hanging out there over staying home with the wife." No, um, do not put words in their mouths. I'm just saying, you know. Okay, John. Sorry. Yeah, anything to add to this part? I think this would be our, some of our final words. Um, I think if you're gonna play any game, if if you have the chance to go to a tournament for it you really should it just if only to get the experience 
the to to see the environment to meet the people it really will change your view on not only the game you're playing but gaming as a whole and what it can truly bring to your life yeah to to add on that also uh today we went to a netrunner release of uh, the latest expansion this kind of legacy set and uh i would say go out to meet people because we we went there to pick up this set and it was just to talk about the ground rules of a campaign that uh this set kind of entails with netrunner it's kind of like a legacy board game expansion but the cards are legal to play in your regular deck well some of the cards not all the cards and okay. it was just a random guy who showed up to pick up his set and to talk about the ground rules with everybody else who picked up their set that day to set the campaign in motion going forward after today, you know? And my brother goes, hey, do you want to learn how to play Vampire? Because uh, we were going to start up a game and just wait for some of the other people to catch up because they said they were running late. The guy's like, yeah, sure, I'll sit down. And he was he really loved the game. He sat in the game and it was a five-player game and he just really enjoyed himself. And he's like, man, this game's so great, blah, blah, blah. It's like, let me get your Facebook and... Next time you guys play, let me know. And we'll, uh, so he he came for one game and just for hanging out like an extra couple of minutes, got roped into playing a completely different game and just had his. You could tell he had a blast today. Like it was, he was just excited to meet people and to find out about a game he just never knew about and just like a game that doesn't necessarily it, it kind of exists. But you know that that's that is a number one thing that a lot of people should go out to tournaments, even just hang out at their game store a little bit longer. Maybe post a notice if you're a gaming store or, you know, local. Uh, some coffee shops also do that where they allow, like, billboards. And put out a little notice, hey, looking for a game, looking for a group of friends to play board games, so-and-so. Uh, we can meet up. Please contact me. And you would be surprised. There's probably, like, a ton of people in your local town or city that are looking for the same thing but maybe too scared to post something or just afraid to meet people or meet up online first or set up a date. And you'll be surprised at the people you find and you have fun with. And you could find yourself a completely new group to play with or your initial group to play with that you had no idea shared the same interests. I, th I think we're filing, or we might be finding that secret message in the Arrival Tournament series. With, <laughs> with what, like finding be... more people? Finding more people to play these group games. Like, yeah, just, again, uh, if someone wants to ask, do you want to play? What, what's what's the harm in learning a new game? And you might find the uh, experience greater than what you originally intended. Yeah, definitely. All right, so I think this is this is a good stopping point. We've been talking for like a while, then a while longer than huh? a while. A whole, a while. <laughs> yeah. All right, so uh, I think we're gonna wrap up. So. Uh, Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for listening to us rant about tournaments and a few other things unintentionally. Uh, but that's how we do things in a, an organized play. We tend to and, ramble uh, like old people and just keep on droning on. So if you like, uh, if you like, uh, like and subscribe to us, uh, please leave comments. Tell us we're stupid. Tell us you're, we're completely wrong. Or maybe surprise us by saying, hey, I like this stuff and I agree. Or give us more uh, ideas what you think we'd... Uh, we, more stuff we maybe, maybe we can talk about. Ask, ask us questions. No, don't be afraid to uh, give your opinion, but then again, this is the internet. You'll always have an opinion. Um, so for tonight, uh, we're signing off. Uh, Pandas is bye. That's what right. Else? Adios, from bro. And take it easy, guys. Thanks for watching, and see you next time. All right. Bye. Bye. See you later.